the State Museum has on loan a collection from Mrs. Gloria Meyer. Her husband acquired the collection during his lifetime and when he passed away she wanted to be able to share this collection with the public. It is 54 autographs that are original autographs that center around the founding fathers of the United States. So they're 18th and 19th century autographs that have accompanying um, images that go along with them. And there are two of them that are from the 20th century that are kind of like the beginning and the end of it. The very first one that we have was the impetus for the collection. And this is a letter sent to Mr. Henry Rabb in San Antonio, Texas in February of 1919. And it's a thank you letter and it is signed by the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Roosevelt. And along with this letter was a check that says it's for binoculars and it's a check for $1, 1 1.00. Mr. Rabb was the grandfather of the uh, collector of this um, of these artifacts and he gave it to his grandson when he was 13 years old and said don't ever cash this check and don't ever lose this letter because it's going to be more valuable than the dollar so he kept it from the time he was 13 and it stimulated an interest in wanting to collect the autographs of uh, major American patriots. The other 20th century autograph is one that uh, has a picture. The autograph is actually on the picture and it's John F. Kennedy and his wife um, Jacqueline and um, it's it's inscribed to, this is probably around 1960, and it's inscribed to someone named Brenda Crane and I did some research and discovered that there was a physician named Dr. Paul Crane who was an interpreter and worked for President Kennedy as well as President Johnson doing some interpretation that he was able to get this autograph from the Kennedys. This is also fairly rare. It's not a great photo. You can see it's been folded, but it's a wonderful picture. Another one that's very interesting that was particularly of interest to the collector is this one on Robert Morris. Robert Morris is not a very well-known uh, American figure because he wasn't a military hero, but he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and also he was a financier and he floated bonds to help finance the American Revolution and that's why this one was of particular interest to the collector because that's what he did. He was a financier himself. Two of the more valuable, if not the most valuable, pieces in the collection is this one that is signed by George Washington. It talks about issues on his farm. He's writing to a friend of his named Mr. Biddle, who also served with him during the American Revolution. And it's basically farm management, essentially, but it is an entire letter and it is signed by him, which is fairly rare. How are each of these pieces selected? He had a professional broker and he had a mission to collect autographs from um, America, had to do with American history. A lot of these have to do with the revolutionary battles or the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Whether or not his goal was to attain all of the signers, I'm not quite sure. It may have been but since he passed away before he was able to complete the collection and not knowing, not having the opportunity to talk to him, I'm not exactly sure what his goals were, but we're very fortunate to be able to share in the collection as he has it. My favorite, one of my favorites, is this one that's signed by John Hancock. And it's as the governor, it's a, a state paper, essentially, a proclamation that he made. Um, and it's uh, for raising a regiment, I believe, yes. And everybody knows John Hancock, thanks to the insurance company, because they did so many commercials on him. When I went to the National Archives to see the Declaration of Independence, where, of course, he signed quite large, and his reason for signing in such a large um, hand was so that there'd be no doubt as to who whose signature it was. You have to think that for the Declaration of Independence, if you signed your name there, you were essentially signing your death warrant 
Because if the Americans didn't win and the British did win, that would be the first group that the British would have gone after were the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So the one at the National Archives is faded and rather difficult to see, whereas this one is a nice, bright signature and easily recognizable as John Hancock. There were men who participated in the American Revolution who signed the Declaration of Independence. They were very daring men. They had no money. They had to finance a war on their own signatures, essentially. And I think he was interested in the mechanics and the administrative details of how that was accomplished. Most people, I think, when they read about the American Revolution and the battles, they get involved in the mil military strategy, and there's quite a lot of that. I mean, he does have quite a lot of information having to do with the war. But also, the letters have to do, for instance, Washington's letter has to do with uh, administrative details on his farm later in life. And I think he was trying to show that the American founding fathers were actually people who lived and died just like anyone else did. On the far left, we have a piece that is signed by Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin, among his many occupations, diplomat and inventor, he was also a printer. And so this document is a receipt for, uh, for printing that is signed by Benjamin Franklin. And it's a little bit later than Revolutionary, it's 1787. But the, print, the receipt is from a man named John Dunlap. And John Dunlap was the official printer of the Declaration of Independence. When it was issued on the 4th of July in 1776, they sent approval, the approved declaration, to John Dunlap, who would typeset it and he would print it. And he printed 200 broadsides, which at that time was about the size of a regular newspaper sheet. There are only 25 copies of the original declaration still in existence. Another couple of autographs that are interesting is Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, and they fought a famous duel. So the collector framed both of these autographs together, and in the middle of it is a picture of the two of them fighting the duel. The one from Aaron Burr is a letter of routine legal matters from December of 1800, and the one from Alexander Hamilton is um, also a legal paper from 1795. This autograph by John Quincy Adams, where he signed as the Secretary of State and its routine departmental business from January 16th of 1818. John Quincy Adams was one of America's great Secretaries of State, arranging with England for the joint occupation of the Oregon Territory and obtaining from Spain the cessation of the Floridas, which included eastern Louisiana. He also formulated the doctrine with President Monroe on the Monroe Doctrine. And then he was sixth President of the United States in 1825. The oldest document that we have in the collection is this full letter that was written by Voltaire. Voltaire was a French philosopher. He is known as the father of the Enlightenment. This letter was written in 1732. And the letter is uh, thanking the author for his criticism or his review of the book of history, the history of Charles the, the Twelfth. As the father of enlightenment, the enlightenment movement is really sort of the basis of the American Revolution. And I think that's probably why the collector included these documents, as well as this book, as sort of the basis for his collection. And also in the French connection, we have a letter from the Marquis de Lafayette who was an early supporter of the American Revolution. He was a French marquis, raised money for the American cause. And you can see that this is a very fine steel point engraving of Monsieur de Lafayette. Um, he's a very uh, slight man, I guess is the best way to describe him. But as the collector would accumulate autographs, he would look for pictures or images of the person 
whose autograph he was collecting. And in some cases, he could only find regular print media and not necessarily good portraits. But as he would come across better portraits, then he would replace the ones that he had initially with better portraits. So he was constantly upgrading the collection. This document is a military appointment of Samuel A. Re Russell to Second Lieutenant, dated August 6, 1861. And this is signed by the President, Abraham Lincoln. Initially, Lincoln would sign his documents with his full name, the way this one is, but as his presidency required more and more paperwork, he began to shorten his signature and just signed as A initial Lincoln. Lincoln. So this is a fairly rare document from his presidency because it does have a full signature. Robert E. Lee, a har harbor certificate from St. Louis, signed in 1838. At that time, Robert E. Lee started to work on two Mississippi River projects. One was to work on the rapids at Des Moines, Iowa, and the other was to remove islands that were threatening the navigation and jeopardizing the commerce of the newly founded town of St. Louis, Missouri. At that time, Captain Henry Miller Shreve also had devised a method for removing snags along the Red River at Shreveport. And sometime prior to 1830, he had invented a snag boat for this purpose. From that time on, when water was low enough to permit, Shreve and his assistants would go through the river, scouring the river for in search of snags so that they could clear it for navigation. So they were working together, Robert E. Lee and Henry Miller Shreve, for whom the city of Shreveport is named, were working together at that time. He puts together a collection of different people's correspondence and information about them that together provide sort of a cohesive history of, of the United States.